This demonstration is about the sampling distribution of the mean. I'm not going to go into all the things we use it for. I'll probably try and mention a few things, but I want to show you how it works, like what it is. I'm going to do something that's uh, like a partial sampling distribution of the mean. So let's um, let's start here. I've got this little programming thing that I wrote in R. I'm pretty proud of this one. It's pretty cool. So let's uh, let's try. Okay, let's start small. Come on down here, you. So what's happening here? Let's try and explain to you what you're seeing, I hope, on your screen here. This is, a, the, the gray bars down here are, let's say, a population. Let's say it's many thousands of students who took some sort of exam. I don't know, national math exam or something. For some weird reason, mostly because I wanted to show some things in this demonstration, it's a uniform distribution, or very nearly so. It's actually a bunch of random, like, I don't know, 10 or 100,000 or something values sampled from a random, dist or from, from a uniform distribution. But they're random, so it's a little wobbly. But a uniform distribution is one where there's the same frequency uh, in all the categories. So the same number of students got scores between 0 and 5, more or less, as between 5 and 10%, as between 10 and 15%. It's ridiculous. Like, no student distribution ever looks like this. By the way, if there's dramatic music to this, that's that's uh, my daughter practicing piano in the other room. I think it just adds to the suspense, the overall mood. So what's happening with these blue and red dots, when four blue dots appear, that's the computer randomly sampling from this distribution of many thousands of student scores. And then the red dot is the mean of those four randomly sampled students. So take four student scores, compute the mean, save the mean. Saving the mean is uh, like we're collecting the means. So you put the mean up top in the graph area in the little L-shaped graph X and Y axis space. Um, so those means are put exactly where they appear. They're, they're, keep in mind a mean is a middle, so the four dots will appear. If it's only three, that means two of them were like kind of on top of each other. That happens a lot. So randomly select four dots, look at the mean, calculate the mean of that, put the mean up there to save it, and then do four more, calculate another mean. So we're collecting means. One of the things you're going to see is that there's less variability in the collection of means than there is in the raw score distribution. So the raw scores down here, which, as I said, it's really weird that they're just, I don't know, that, that they're uniform distribution. And it's artificial. I just did that because I wanted you to show that the distribute, wanted to show you that the distribution of the means will be a different shape. This is a flat distribution, and up here we are not seeing a flat distribution. We're going to see about three things noteworthy. Number one, the mean of all these means will be very close to the mean, this red line, which is the mean of the raw score distribution of all the student scores themselves. So the mean of the means is the mean, as I usually say, which means the mean of the sampling means here is the mean of this distribution. It's only exactly the mean if we do like an infinite number of samples or all possible samples and take all those means, which of course would take us until the end of the universe, so we're not going to do that. But if you do like a million, it's really, really freaking close, down to like a whole bunch of decimal places. It's a very powerful effect. Uh, the, the mean of these means tends to be the mean. So the mean of the means is the mean. That's the first thing. The second thing is there's less variability in the sampling distribution than there is in the original raw score distribution. The original raw score distribution is uh, this big uniform thing where you're just as likely to have 100 as 20 as 60. Everything's equally likely. But with the means, you're much more likely to have a middle number than an extreme number. Look, there's nothing in the 80 plus, or there's only one dot below 20. There's nothing above 80. These means cluster more towards the middle. And that makes sense. If you have four friends and they all want to, and, and you say, like, let's find out a place where we all want to eat. Someone wants Chinese, somebody wants Italian, somebody wants pizza, somebody wants burgers. Like, what are the odds that you're going to be able to find a place that everybody wants to eat? Well, not ridiculously high. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. What are the odds that you're going to find four values that are very close to each other? And then if you wanted to get a mean really far up here, like above 90 or below 10, You'd have to they not they'd have to be not only really close to each other but they'd also also have to be really high high values so it's not that likely that that's going to happen oops there's one 
it's 85, 86. That's pretty good. But so, but there are very few of those. If you do this thousands of times, you will get values as low as you know, down close to zero and down up to 100. Maybe exactly zero, maybe exactly 100. It's unlikely, but it can, but it can happen. But you won't get very many of them. You'll get a lot of values in the middle instead, because there's a lot of ways that can happen. The mean is a middle. And when you have these four dots, the middle tends to be closer to the middle of the whole range of numbers. So it's a very common experience to see that the mean of, of, the, of the numbers comes close to the middle. So that's why there's less variability. In other words, the, the dots are clustered, clustered more together when they're means than the original observations are. There's more clustering. That means lower variability, lower standard deviation of this group of numbers than this original distribution group of numbers. Uh, let's let's do like let's do like a sample size of ten and speed it up a little bit. Let's do like maybe two hundred. So same situation. You got this uniform random distribution. By the way, it goes up a teeny bit on the left and down a teeny bit on the right. Not because the distribution actually does that, but because R has weird rules for doing histograms, and that's what that is. Just a histogram. So 10 values mean, 10 values mean, 10 values mean, 10 values mean. Again, we're seeing clustering in the middle. And it's actually clustering around the mean of the original raw score distribution. That's like a gravitation point, and things don't want to move too far from it. OK, I have a lot of sci-fi analogies in my head for everything, including stats. Now, the fact that there's some gaps here, don't worry about it. Overall, if you smooth an average across this, the, da the gaps don't matter. They get filled. The shape that this is building very slowly and is kind of jagged and ugly is the normal distribution, the classic bell curve. It's not super normal right now, but it's a lot more normal than this flat line down here is. This flat line is not remotely normal. It's flat. There's not much curve at all to it. But we're seeing kind of a bell curve. We're seeing stuff clustering around the mean. Not perfectly, but it's getting there. Very few extreme values far from the mean. There's a couple on the on the high side here, which makes me wonder if I did my algorithm weird, or maybe it's just randomness. Randomness happens. R has pretty good random number selection engines, I think, so or so I've heard. So yeah, this is kind of looking sort of like a rough bell curve-ish. Not amazingly like it, but it's happening. And it's a little more than the last one because there's a larger number of observations being sampled for every sample, uh, creating every mean. Every mean is created from a larger number of, of test scores. So this is a sample size of 25. Each, each sample has 25 observations, so there's lots of blue dots. So each mean comes from 25 student scores. So these are means of 25 student scores that are stacking up in the dark red in the top area. They're clustering even more because now there's 25, and it's even less likely that the average of 25 things is going to be extreme, extremely low or extremely high. It's much more likely to be in the middle. The larger number of observations you have for every mean, the less likely the mean is to be extreme. It's just not likely. You're not going to get 25 things. You could do this enough times. You might have a couple samples where all 25 things are above 90, or all 25 scores selected randomly are below 10. But it won't happen very often at all. Like, we don't even have anything above 70 or below 30 right now. Previously, things went from about 15 to 85 or even 90. Now things are going between about 30 and 70. Well, they're a bit of, there's one above 70. So 150 means, I think we can wait until this is done, and it'll show us what the mean of all those means is, which is nice a nice thing to know. There you go. The mean of all the means is slightly higher than the mean of the original distribution. But if we did like a million of these things, the mean of the means would be incredibly close, like down to several decimal places. It would be the same as the mean of the raw distribution. If we did an infinite number of samples and waited here until the end of the universe and beyond, then the mean of 
all the sample means would be perfectly and exactly the same as the mean of the raw score distribution. Now, we don't have to do that. We can just imagine that because the mathematicians work this stuff out for us. But I wanted to demonstrate it, what it looks like. Now, these green lines are just an estimate of where 95% of the means would appear. It's a confidence interval, which we'll learn about later. So that's an N of... Let's do like maybe 300 tries with an N of 100. So every sample will be 100 observations. So every, every mean in that mean spot will be an average of 100 student test scores. And I'm not even going to animate the blue dots because I want it to go fast enough that we can just see the pattern of here. The blue dots would just be a weird blue blur at this speed. Look how smooth that's becoming. Look how, look how bell curvy it is. It's going to be a tall, skinny bell curve, but that's okay. The normal distribution just describes a mathematical curving of a line, like across the top of a histogram or something. And it doesn't matter uh, whether that's... It, that can be skinny and tall, or it can be wide and fat. It doesn't matter. It still is the normal distribution. It is the, the bell curve. It's the Gaussian distribution. It's another name for that. Oh, and look how very close the mean of the means is to the mean of the underlying distribution. And that's much more normal. The fact that it has some spikes in there, I'm not concerned at all. It's only 300 means. It's not that many. We could do like 3,000 means, and it would uh, be a lot more smooth. But we're, and, and also, it's squished in. It, the means were from 100 observations. That confidence interval now, in other words, showing where the middle 95% of all these means is, more or less, it's between about 45 and 55. It's a range of only 10 points now. The previous means, those confidence intervals were much wide. The takeaways here are, number one, the mean of the means is the mean. The mean of the sampling means, if we did a million of them, a billion of them, it would be exactly the mean, the mean of the original distribution. And what we're going to be dealing with is the sampling distribution of means kind of theoretically. This is just doing some simulations to kind of see how it might happen. But what we use in class will be theoretical sampling distribution of the means, which is a perfect infinite thing that doesn't exist in real life and would take until the end of the universe to calculate. But that's okay. We don't have to calculate it because mathematicians have figured out what it would be. And what they say that this, and I believe them because I've read some of the proofs and I used to be smart enough to follow a few of those things. And I trust my former self now. And I trust them. They're the mathematicians. And so they, they've worked out that the average of all the averages, the average of all these sample means from any sample size, whether it's from sample size of four or sample size of a, a thousand or sample size of 20, the average of those, if you take all of them, like an infinite number or an insane number of them, the average of those will be exactly the average of all the scores in the underlying distribution, the original distribution of scores. And they, and they will tell us, and we're seeing here, the variability in the distribution of means is always smaller than in the variability, or it's always less than the variability of here. Like this standard deviation, I don't know, it might be something like 20 or 30 points, but up here the standard deviation might be like, I don't know, three, five? Very small, a, a lot smaller. So variability gets much less. We like that because we're going to use this process for estimating things about populations by using our samples. Bigger sample sizes produce smaller standard deviations in this conceptual standard uh, sampling distribution of means. And that makes our, our uh, estimations more precise and more likely to be correct as well, more likely to be valid. So we like big samples. When, um, when people criticize the statistics by saying, oh, it's just all based on the normal distribution and things aren't normal in, real, in the normal distribution in real life, well, okay, first, a lot of things are kind of normal in real life. But much more importantly, tons of our questions are actually based on the sampling distribution of means and you can take even a non-normal distribution and the sampling distribution of means becomes very normal really quickly, even with fairly small sample sizes, like 20. 20 is a pretty reasonable sample size, or 30 or so, if you have a distribution that's at least more or less symmetrical, that you're not even normal underlying, just symmetrical. And a lot of things are kind of normal-ish in the raw scores, and then Almost any sample distribution from those becomes normal very fast. So if we do a research study and we have 100 observations, 100 participants in our study, and we're trying to estimate the mean of something, we can be very confident that our mean estimation, not our raw scores, but our mean estimation 
is part of a situation that is fairly precise and conforms to the normal distribution. And we can use the normal distribution to calculate probabilities like p-values and confidence. Let's try a really terrible... I'm going to work from a known skewed distribution, randomly sampled skewed distribution. This is called a gamma distribution. It's skewed to the right like this, very positively, like a nice little ski slope. So we're taking um, five observations every time, calculating the mean. I think you know how this goes now. There's the means. The red bar at the bottom is the mean of that gamma distribution. Normally we'd be looking at a median for a skewed distribution like this. This skew is probably beyond plus two, two and a half, three. But it's a bad skew. It's a skew that you wouldn't want for analysis. You wouldn't want to use means and standard deviations. Those are sensitive um, descriptive statistics. If you're trying to describe this, you'd probably use a median and an IQR instead of a mean and a standard deviation. However, we're not just describing things. We're using this for inference. So I want to show you how uh, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals might work for this because they would be based on the sampling distribution of means, which is about the means. So you can see that those means are clustering around the mean of the population and that they're becoming more normal. So the bigger the sample size, the less variability there is in the sampling distribution of means. In other words, the smaller that standard deviation is. By the way, when we have a standard deviation of a sampling distribution, we don't call it a standard deviation anymore. Just like as a little linguistic thing, we call it a standard error. It's just a standard deviation, but it's the standard deviation of these guys. Down here, we call it a standard deviation. We're like, the standard deviation is 12.7 or something. But up here, when we, we wouldn't say the standard deviation, we'd say the standard error of the mean, which means the standard deviation from the sampling distribution of means. All these means, their standard deviation. If we just treat them like numbers, calculate the standard deviation. I don't know, it might be like 7 or something. 10 at the outside? Probably not that much. I'm not that great at guessing. I should stop guessing. So you can see that this is clustering. It's becoming kind of normal, kind of lumpy in the middle with a little bit of tails on the side. It's still skewed positively. You can see it's kind of higher on the left and kind of goes down to the right, but it's not much skew. Now let's do an N of 12. Go on again. 12 observations each. Going a little faster. I told it to 150, and so the graphs, it squished the dots down so they'll fit. At least I hope it did. They're stacking a little overlapped, but that's okay. It's just a demonstration. It's not the perfect graph to end all graphs. So you can see things are squishing even more. The standard deviation up there is smaller. It might be only like three or four or five now. It was closer to maybe 10 last time. So it's smaller because we have 12 observations instead of five that contribute to each mean. So they cluster more. They're less likely to be extreme. The more observations are included in each mean, the less likely each mean is to be really far to the right or to the left, just much less likely. And it doesn't take much. I mean, they're already less likely if you just only have a few points. It's just unlikely that's going to happen. So there's still positive skew. You can see that it's kind of a little slope going down and to the right. Ignore the fact that it's jagged and that there's like a drop at nine. That's okay. There's some rounding rules in there for my programming that are probably not making that any better. But just kind of smooth across that. It's becoming kind of smooth anyway. That's looking pretty good, man. I like this. This is beautiful. So yeah, it's still positively skewed, but not very much. It's looking pretty good. It's a lot more normal than it was before. Let's, let's see where we've gotten to. Isn't that nice? Oh, that's so beautiful. It's so sweet. I love it. It's like nice and smooth. It's still positively skewed. I mean, it drops down pretty harsh on the right there a little bit. But overall, that's not much skew. That skew is going to be like plus 0 0.5 or something. If we just wanted to calculate means and standard deviations on that, we'd have no trouble with it. Remember, the standard deviation of these red dots is going to be called the standard error of the mean. And that is nice. That's a relatively normal distribution. I love it. It's beautiful. I'm going to let this one finish because I think we're pretty close. Yay. And look how close this mean is. It's just slightly below the mean of the distribution. The confidence interval is much narrower, so 95, our estimate of 95% of where these means would fall uh, is much smaller. It's between like 9 and 4. 4 and 9, that, that's pretty small. It's much smaller than the 90% estimate for the raw score distribution for mean. 
So 50 observations per mean. And let's speed it up a bit. Oh, there are still blue dots. I didn't realize that. I forgot I left that in. So watch how this grows. First of all, it's just smaller. It's just left to right. It's skinnier. There's even less variability. 50 observations each. So the, the formula for this, to figure out what the standard deviation of this sampling distribution of the means is, in other words, what the standard error is, is to take the standard deviation of the original distribution and to divide it by the square root of the number of observations in each of those samples. Square root of n. So, I don't know. Let's take a wild, I'm going to take a wild guess. What would the standard deviation of this distribution be? Like maybe 10, 15? Let's say it's 15. Well, let's say it's 14 because the square root of 50 is pretty close to the square root of 49. I can't do square root of 50 in my head, but square root of 49 is 7. I know that. So if, if this was, a, it, okay, this is rough estimation, but if this down here, the, the right skewed distribution, the original scores, the student scores that are all wonky and positively skewed, let's say these are like, I don't know, let's say this isn't scores. Let's, just, let's say this is number of charitable acts committed by college students per day. Most people are doing a few charitable acts, but there's those students up here. There's this person committing f like 34, 40 charitable acts per day. Um, that's the super awesome, nice person, possibly needs to deal with personal boundaries or something. Um, that, so if this standard deviation was 14, then the standard deviation up here is 14 divided by the square root of 50, which is pretty close to 7. So it's about 2. That's actually not too bad. I think that's reasonable. I, I think I've estimated relatively well. And so you get a confidence interval between about a little more than a five, than 5 up to about 8. About 3 points wide-ish. Okay, I think that's the end of this demonstration. Takeaways. The sampling distribution of the means has less variability than the underlying distribution. In other words, that it has a smaller standard deviation. How small? Precisely, an original standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That's how, how much smaller. Bigger n, much smaller standard deviation. So sample size of 100, a lot smaller standard error of the mean than sample size of 10. So you can fix lots and lots of problems by having increased sample size. So you can get much more precise estimation. And that that's connected to takeaway two, which is the distribution of means is much more normal shaped than the underlying distribution. And the bigger the sample size of each of those observations, the more, more, more normal, the more increasingly normaliness you have in the sampling distribution of the means. And uh, there was some other thing. I don't know. There was like a third takeaway, and I've probably said it elsewhere. So um, we use this for estimating. So. The, the way we usually use this is we don't know what the population, we don't know this stuff down here. We don't know the population mean. We just take one sample of like, I don't know, 50 observations. And we're trying to estimate the total number of um, charitable student acts done by Fredonia students or something. And so we interview 50 students. So then we will imagine, we don't know what the true population is, mean is. We don't know how many, what, what's the average for all Fredonia students. We wish we knew that, but we don't. But we can get a pretty good idea about it by starting from the fact that we know that with 50 observations each, this is what the sampling distribution of means has to look like. So we don't know if we're like down here, or maybe even down here it's possible, or maybe even up here. Like, did we just get a really weird group of students and we have a crazy number of, of charitable acts per week or something? Or a really weird group of low, you know, low charitable number? number of charitable acts per week. We don't know, but we do know that those things aren't very likely. If we got a sample, a sample mean from 50 observations and we did decent sampling, like random sampling, then we know there's a pretty good likelihood that it comes from the middle. If it was 500 observations, we'd know there's a very good like, like even much higher likelihood because the middle would be so much smaller. It's so unlikely to have anything far away from this middle part. So we can guess that our, like the bigger our sample size is, the more confident we are that our mean is pretty close to the population mean. Now, 
that's a pretty rough form of reasoning, and it's we're going to do some more sophisticated and unfortunately unsatisfying reasoning later that's more complicated. But for right now, think about that. The, the larger your sample size, because this sampling distribution of means is so small, your sample comes from that distribution. It's one of those dots. Your sample is one of these dots. Well, if we kept going millions of times, there would be dots all the way along here, but there would be very, very few dots here and a very few more here, but then tons here, and then few, 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 few. And if we had 100 observations, there'd be almost all of them piled up right in this middle. So if we get a sample and we calculate the mean, look at the sample size, we can figure out how likely it is that our sample is close to the, the population mean. Our sample mean is close to the population mean. And that's part of